Yeah. All right. All right. Welcome to the to the last panel of our today uh, ASIL conference on Uline Social Justice. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome our two speakers for this teaching workshop, uh, Yola Solanke, who I already introduced this morning. So um, um, here we go again. She is professor of EU law and social justice at the Faculty of Law at Leeds University. And she wrote extensively about gender and uh, race, about labor law and EU judiciary. Something that I did not mention this morning, but that I think is important to mention here is that she is also the Dean for Equality diversity and inclusion, right? That's the, right, yes. And I hope that she will share uh, her experience uh, with us uh, today. And, um, and our second speaker, Fernanda uh, Nicola, who is professor of law at the Washington College of Law, American University, and who is also the director of the Program on International Organization, Organizations, Law and Development, Fernanda is working on EU constitutional law, comparative family and private law and transnational legal theory. And she co-authored uh, a book entitled EU Law Stories, Contextual and Critical Histories in European Jurisprudence in 2017. That was right, published in 2017. And it's really a wonderful book that is looking sort of behind some of the canonical EU decisions, sort of giving the context really a, a, an amazing collection of essays. So Eleanor Spaventa uh, was supposed to join us, but due to a, to a, um, a family emergency, she, she, she couldn't. So just before giving the floor to Yola and, and Fernanda, I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of a background. Uh, the idea here so what we wanted to do is to ask Yola and, and Fernanda, who both have experienced teaching you law in relation to issues of distributive justice, gender, sexuality, and, and critical race theory, to tell us how they designed their syllabus um, uh, and to tell us a bit about the challenges in the classroom, what they learned from their experiences, and also to really think about any concrete you know, tips, any advice that they could give to uh, EU law teachers who would like to integrate these topics in their teaching, but for some reason don't feel that, uh, don't feel that, that they, they will know how to do it or don't know where to start. So really to sort of, um, yes, give us uh, concrete tools uh, and also maybe ideas to, to question our uh, teaching methods um, and syllabus. And this is something that is an ongoing, ongoing conversation at ASEL where we, where we um, recently had a, a conversation about uh, how to make our teaching more inclusive, how to revisit the canons and perhaps change the canons. So uh, um, these are uh, some of the ideas, some of the, the questions that, that we are already asking ourselves. About the format, so each uh, speaker has 10 to 15 minutes um, to tell us about the syllabus design, to tell us about um, their teaching methods. Uh, I asked them to choose specific cases or, or to at least base their, their um, talk on specific cases, and we circulated some materials and new decisions beforehand. Um, so I'll give you the floor. This is very much, again, like all these roundtables, a conversation. So first, Yola and uh, Fernanda will, will, will talk for 10, 15 minutes, and then we will open up for questions. Uh, really, the idea is to have a conversation about how do we teach EU law. OK, uh, Yola? Should I begin? OK. OK, well, thank you again, Ivana, for um, uh, inviting me to, to be part of this uh, this teaching workshop, it's a, it's a very um, interesting idea and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from everybody else on your ideas and experiences about teaching EU law. Um, I think it, it would be, it might be interesting for you to hear about how I came into teaching EU law, which will um, then explain to you why I take the particular approach to EU law that I do. 
So um, my undergraduate degree was in languages. Uh, so I studied German um, and French. And uh, as I was coming to the end of my degree, I um, was uh, interested to do some voluntary work. And I began work with a charity, which was called the Standing Conference on Racial Equality in Europe. So that was my uh, introduction, if you like, to um, the European Union and European law. And the, the key interest of this charity was to um, ensure that racial discrimination was taken seriously within European Union law. And so that was, that was my job, basically, to, to lobby um, uh, for uh, an amendment to the Treaty of Rome to actually include um, article, what is now Article 19. So my introduction to EU law was very much from an activist perspective. And it was very much from the perspective of trying to ensure that um, uh, black and minority ethnic people in Europe were also part of the process of European integration. So um, it was a, a voluntary organization. We lost our funding as many voluntary organizations do. And I was made redundant. And that's when I went to the LSE to start my formal study of uh, the European Union. So I first did a master's in European social policy and then my PhD in EU law, where I had the, the good fortune to be taught by Damien Chalmers. Um, and as many of you will know, he takes a, a very um, contextual and political approach to European Union law. Uh, and I was able to not only have him as my supervisor, but I also started to teach EU law uh, under his tutelage. So my approach to EU law has, has always been uh, contextual. It's informed by my practical experience be before coming into academia and then by the, the, the way in which I was basically trained to teach EU law. But when I came to, to design in, um, to having the opportunity to, to design my own syllabus and then to write my own textbook, I wanted to go a little bit, a, a little bit further. Um, because I felt that the political approach was um, uh, a bit too Eurocentric and a bit too masculine. So uh, then I went back to my, uh, my studies and my experience in, in school, in the voluntary sector, and started to look for ways to bring um, those perspectives and those, uh, the, the, the voices of the people I was working with into uh, teaching European Union law. Um, and that's when I discovered um, the, the real challenge, actually, because the, the standard canon of European Union law is fairly well set. You know, you have uh, Joe Vila, Alex Stern Sweet, um, you know, the, the big names. Um, Gronje de Berka is one of the, the few big female names at that time. Um, there was Rosa Greaves. But there weren't even very, very many um, female voices. Joe Shaw, who was, was here this morning, um, there weren't very many female voices that were integral to, to the EU canon. And then when I started to, to think about um, looking for some, some black authors, um, that was an even bigger struggle because there just aren't. We've just heard from Diamond Dash Yagbor. Um, she's one of the few. Um, people of color who write on European Union law. So that was a struggle. Uh, the other thing I really wanted to do was um, place, the, the, place the, the, the process of European integration within a more global context. And that, that also links back to the conversation in the previous panel. And that was also something that, that wasn't very regularly done in um, your, um, your, your standard traditional European Union law module. And as, as I wrote in the chat, the one text that I found that did that was written by somebody called Grilly, and that was written in, in the mid eighties. So that really wasn't a kind of mainstream perspective. And to be honest, I was quite nervous about bringing that in um, because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want my students to think that I wasn't teaching them, you know, the, the right things. And I also um, didn't want to be seen as straying too far from, from the accepted 
uh, approach to EU law. So it's been a very, very kind of slow um, and very kind of um, tentative, taking tentative steps to um, creating a, a syllabus that is more inclusive. Uh, coming back to Christina's um, question this morning, it's not just inclusive research, it's also inclusive teaching. Um, so I now do have more um, voices, more authors from, um, from black and minority ethnic communities on my syllabus, but it really is still a struggle um, to, to find them and especially to find um, uh, black female writers whose work can be used in the teaching of European Union law. Um, and then to find the cases that can be used um, to, to, to really bring out some key social justice issues because there aren't many cases, uh, as we mentioned this morning, that talk about discrimination uh, beyond gender. So um, we were asked to, to, to talk about a particular case. And so the case that I've chosen is Zambrano. Um, do you want me to, to go into that now, Ivana, or should I stop here? Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. I've created a, a little slide um, just to set out, oops, can you see that? No, uh, oh, there we go. Um, let me do this here. So I created this slide just to um, kind of illustrate how I try to get my students to think about social justice issues um, in relation to EU case law. I'm just trying to make that a bit larger. So I think that the most useful, uh, one of the most useful perspectives that I can um, expose my students to, which they don't find, well, which they haven't to date found in many other places in, in the curriculum, is critical race theory and critical race feminism. Um, and I like the Zambrano case because it allows me to bring those, use that perspective quite effectively uh, in, a, in a substantive way to, to talk about race and gender in European Union law and to bring in um, other authors from other jurisdictions, but also um, from other perspectives, as I mentioned earlier. So um, I'll just go through this table and then we can have a discussion about it maybe later. So one method I use, as I've said, is to use critical race theory and critical race feminism. Um, in relation to the Zambrano case, because it, it highlights so nicely um, the, uh, the nationality and citizenship, the importance of citizenship, and the very specific national, um, national rules on immigration and asylum, I use it to, to bring in a, that broader legal context. Um, and talking about citizenship is something that's very productive with students because everybody has citizenship. And especially if you have an international class, then it's something that, that gets them thinking about themselves and their own situation in particular of course, if they are international students and they're, they've come uh, on, on a visa and they're, they're paying additional fees. So it really does uh, help them to put themselves in, in the situation and, and that can give rise to a really good uh, conversation. Um, another thing that I've, I find very helpful to do is to bring in a wider range of publications. Uh, not just because students often don't read journal articles, but also because uh, shorter blogs and newspaper articles are just easily accessible. Um, they can download them on their phones, they can read them on the bus while they're, you know, wherever they are. And it also makes the makes EU law um, appear to be more more current. You know, it's 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 it relates to what's happening now, and I think that always helps to to stimulate students' interest in, in the subject. But also you can use blogs from different um, jurisdictions. Uh, and in relation to teaching Zambrano, I try to use it to demonstrate the differences in the national political responses, um, which also helps to show that not all member states have a negative response to EU law. Um, it's also very, uh, it's a very nice case to show the 
interaction between national and EU systems, legal systems, and also international systems. So uh, you I can talk uh, very well in relation to this case about how national um, national administrations respond to EU law. Uh, and in particular, in this case, it's very good to show the difference in what happens with EU law in the various member states. And in particular, in relation to this case, it helps to highlight the different ways in which the welfare state systems work and uh, the, different, um, the different rules that are introduced to, to change uh, welfare, welfare law. And that is helpful to highlight structural discrimination. So I talk about uh, the changes that were made to, to uh, welfare legislation in the United Kingdom and the, um, the challenges that were made to those changes in the national courts. However, that's quite a complicated story to tell. So I'm not sure that the, the students really do understand the, the full implications of, so, of the social security aspects because it, it's, it's very, very specific. Um, and then in relation to Zambrano again, it's useful, it's helpful to bring in uh, central questions relating to human rights uh, and in particular the rights of the child it's, it's a very nice case from which to um, try to put yourself in the perspective of the child and talk about things such as the the right to parent and the need to parent in what parenting actually means um, I'm not sure that works which is why it says not sure not sure in both boxes there but I think um, a case like Zambrano does offer uh, so many different aspects, so many different opportunities to highlight social justice issues and also to highlight um, those issues, not just at the European level, but also at the national level. So I'll stop there and hand over to Fernanda. Thank you, Yola. Um, thank you so much. Um, Fernanda? Yes, let me um, start with uh, where Yola left it because there's a beautiful chapter in EU Law Stories by Francesca Strumia uh, that talks about how the Zambrano case is litigated in a Belgian court by a lawyer that strategically chooses to make this uh, um, uh, into a labor case as opposed to an immigration case. And so there's also a legal strategy there that they know they're not gonna get anywhere for the Zambrano parents if they presented in the Belgian court as an immigration case, but they have an opening as a labor case. Then of course the court, the case goes to the ECJ, but I think uh, the local legal strategy was also very interesting. Um, and, and that brings me to my, uh, my talk, and um, as Ivana mentioned, EU law stories, really trying to open up uh, these kind of EU black box of the cases to what happens to the ground. What are the distributive effects of these cases on the ground and who litigates these cases uh, before the court of justice because these cases don't come pre-packaged to the court of justice. And we heard from Yola that uh, lots of the race cases have not been litigated as they could have. And one of the problems is the courts, the courts, the German courts, and Granny has done a study about it, um, or how the German courts do not, they kind of stop the race cases and they do not go to the court of justice. Um, and uh, so um, what we did uh, with my colleague, a legal historian, Bill Davis, we brought together a group of scholars and we asked them to be detectives and really go into the weeds of the cases and see how these cases were, um, were uh, starting. And of course, we bumped into the work of uh, Antoine Boucher and the whole Euro lawyers and then Tom Pavone and many others who were really looking at more of the sociology of the legal profession and really looking at the European bar, who brings these cases basically? Uh, why do they start? What is the purpose? Um, and that was very much at the heart of uh, my uh, dissertation, which was uh, a dissertation on European, my PhD on European consumer law, where I was really trying to understand 
this dichotomy uh, between uh, uh, the social and the market. And it's so funny to me that both yesterday when we talked with the PhD students and today in the panel right before this session, this is still the, the one of the most salient issues between the social and the market, between social Europe versus neoliberal Euro. And that was already something that I was looking at in uh, the early 2000 uh, in, uh, through the lenses of European consumer law. And it's so strange to me that we are so much stuck into that uh, framework, even though I do think uh, the Damien Philo have really tried to, to bring different lenses of analysis of the a social versus market debate. And what uh, I was so surprised and I, I wrote about was really the denial, especially of the scholarship that was so caught into the social versus market Europe um, in looking at the distributive consequences locally, uh, very much who are the winners and the losers of this European consumer law? Or how, um, how this European consumer law has effects on uh, different social groups, different social uh, classes, or how it affects men or women differently, how it affects Northerners or Southerners, Easterners or Westerners, the rich and the poor, the blacks and the white, the Roma or the Europeans in a very different way. And, uh, I was shocked uh, and I did wrote my dissertation um, not entering into the favors of any of the European consumer law um, scholars because I really said that uh, there was an open denial of the um, of a, and to do any distributive analysis, really looking at the distributive effects on the ground uh, of European consumer law. And so that was the first step uh, of my theoretical construct, which didn't make any friends really. But the second step was actually a, a slight recognition is on the left and the right, some scholars were doing some distributive analysis, but yet they were still missing the point because while the scholars on the on the left, including people like Hugh Collins or David Tri Trubeck and Terry Bourgogne were writing about EU consumer protection with a federalist, US approach or Hugh Collins were talking about substantive distributive justice as opposed to procedural distributive justice, yet there was no account of distributive effect who was doing the groundwork, who was really pushing for helping consumers, the poor, the women, the disadvantaged communities. Uh, on the right, on the other hand, there was a clear importation of uh, US law and economics, um, which was really promoting efficiency with uh, ideas of autonomy and subsidiarity, but yet no distributive analysis was on the, um, on the horizon. So uh, in my application of the distributive analysis, what I did in my work was really basically comparing two sets of cases going beyond the idea of indeterminacy as of course a component in the critical canon, but really looking how these two directives, one on products liability and the other one on uh, um, unfair contract terms were playing a role on the ground in the Spanish context. And what I found was that uh, um, while the, the regressive distributive effects of the product liability directive, which included carve outs, requested on grounds of efficiency, and they were really the product of producers and corporate lobbies. So these groups knew very well what were the distributive effects of uh, these uh, carve outs included in the product liability directive, which ended up creating uh, massive losses for uh, consumers who had re uh, received, for instance, inflect, infected blood um, and in Spain, where there wasn't like in Germany, a big public fund for um, recovery, a health, public health fund for recovery in these cases, consumers were clearly hurt uh, because they didn't have the means to really address these uh, um, this huge damage. On the other hand though, the unfair contract terms directive 
was op created an opening, an opening that was mobilized by a judge, a judge of first instance in Barcelona. This guy became a hero. And um, we write about in your stories in our um, Oceano Grupo story. And um, this judge of first instance saw an opening in the unfair contract law directive and created a procedural mechanism that allowed the judge of, on his own motion, not even to call the consumer to come before the court, but to assess immediately damages for to the consumer for an unfair contract term. In this case was a sale of an encyclopedia. So Seattle Group has seen the, in the in the late 90s, a minor initiative that this judge of first instance in Barcelona triggered based on the unfair contract directive. In 2008, the same doctrine and the same judge in Barcelona mobilized the unfair contract terms directive in the financial crisis for uh, the famous Spanish mortgage default case, creating the well-known Aziz case, same judge, same local judge in the in the court of first instance of Barcelona. So this kind of progressive redistributive effect, completely unexpected and mobilized by a local judge, was what triggered uh, really uh, this incredible second life that uh, I wrote with my co-author Evelyn Tishadu, a long-term clerk at the European Court of Justice, who saw this case coming from the same judge in Barcelona, and she basically said, you know, the initiative in from Oceano ended up turning into Aziz and creating a huge recovery, a huge solace for those Spanish consumer who were about to lose their their um, their houses. Okay, so where are we left today? Um, I do think uh, that uh, looking at uh, who's on the ground, who's mobilizing EU law is, is necessary and it's key. And that's why EU stories became um, a, a kind of an important contribution to the field because we really ask all our contributors this is not okay. You cannot stay in the heaven of legal concept in the doctrinal realm. You go and interview the lawyers. And we had um, amazing uh, results, including uh, L'Affaire, um, uh, the Affair uh, Melki, which is a famous case uh, that um, is always studied as uh, a case of French constitutional law. Um, and Daniela Caruso and Joanna Genève, they ended up talking about uh, the lawyer who actually brought this case was a lawyer who basically uh, was concerned with racial profiling of Algerians who were crossing the border between France and, and Belgium. And in reality, they start talking about, similarly to what uh, I think Diamond was talking about, um, that this racial profiling uh, had its history and uh, it's um, back to the colonial ties where Algerians who initially benefited of a favorable trade regime. Algeria was part of the European Union early on until they fought an independence war, disentangled from France, and this disentanglement cost Algeria in terms of, of trade and, um, and um, their economics was a huge cost. Now having to import into the European community uh, at a very high cost, their grapes to make wine that clearly was not really traded in the Middle East. So um, this allowed us to open up the distributive, what are really the distributive consequences on the ground? How does it work? Um, when I teach European law, going back to my syllabus, there are two things I try to do. Um, do they work or not? I'm not sure. Um, and the first thing that I try to do is class one is called the history and legal framework. Um, and I'm happy to share, uh, if you want to share the class one, uh, the class one uh, video, if I can. Um, and, um, and what I do, thanks to also, I, I say Bill uh, Davis, and also my colleague, Michelle Egan, with whom we teach sporadically. Um, okay, I'm not able to share, but I don't need to share. Um, what I do basically, am I able now to share? Let me see. Oh, great. Okay. So this is class one. 
And basically we do the classic Schumann declaration, basic treaty stuff. Um, and then I use uh, Piers Ludlow, who has this beautiful piece on the making of the new Europe where immediately talks about the tensions who were at the core. So if you take a Morten Rasm Rasmussen approach where you put to the front, there were tensions. There were clear battles be between federalist and anti-Europeanist anti, uh, at the core of this project. Ladlov talks about that from the beginning. So even the Schumann project is not an uncontested project. Um, the other piece is Laurent Valouzet. Uh, there is a great political economy piece that shows how there are different political economy uh, visions of Europe. They're characterizing um, a, a, the more, um, what we, you guys call the social Europe. There is actually um, def different political economy uh, views of that and he does a beautiful kind of um, uh, historical understanding of that through uh, the through time and finally uh, I think the Euro Africa piece uh, by Peo Hansen and his co-authors it's, it's fantastic to do the kind of work that uh, um, that Diamond uh, was talking about to basically show that there was the, the tabula rasa idea with the Schumann declaration is not gone but it's very much there from the get-go this idea that uh, Europe is something new is detached from its colonial past and we all know about the holocaust and we want to go further and abandon um, abandon the Nazi um, uh, the, the Nazi past that's and uh, and really move on towards uh, a tab with the tabula rasa with a new constitutional construct um, that's not that's just a fiction because there were lots of colonial ties because uh, uh, there were lots of uh, um, of also uh, people who had collaborated in the Vichy government or um, or in the Italian fascism who were repurposed to the European project and they were just, you know, they didn't change their, their views. So that's one way to do it um, for the past. For the distributive uh, consequences, let me get out. I don't need to share this anymore. Uh, for the, so I'm happy to post any syllabus you need, but for the distributive consequences, um, uh, another thing I do, and I have, I think it might be less successful here. Uh, what, what I always try to do is to get my students to, to take the positions in a case and to be the lawyers and to be um, the member states, uh, to be um, the various uh, litigants, etc. And so I choose a case where they can do the, all that. Um, recently, I've been using, for instance, the Polisario Front, which I love. It's a great case. Um, um, of uh, litigation between the Polisario Front and the EU. It's an international trade law, basically, is the common commercial policy at stake. But um, the disconnect I found there is that um, the distributive consequences that are very much there in article newspapers articles that I give to my students. Of course, there's a huge, there are two basic uh, kind of dilemma in this uh, challenges the, this EU Morocco trade agreement. On the one hand, there are distributive consequences about the trade, actually trade implication between the EU Morocco uh, trade that is impaired by the recent Polisario Front decision that, that stops the fishery agreement, stops lots of the trade regime between the EU and Morocco because of the um, damaging consequences on this so Sahrawi population in Western Africa. And uh, of course, there is that part that is very well uh, documented in the papers, but there's very little in the court opinion that my case litigate, than my students litigate. Um, on the other hand, you have another big distributive in, uh, consequence, which is migration. So as soon as, uh, um, as soon as uh, the EU Morocco deal is in trouble, what Morocco does is opens up the gates in Southern Melilla and allows migrants to, to go to the borders of Europe. And so migrants are used by Morocco, as just, exactly just like Belarus with Poland, migrants are used as a weapon to basically continue the trade between the EU and Morocco. So the Polisario front, the, the big problem that I have is that students know very well what are these two distributive 
the consequences of this the EU um, the, the Polisario Front uh, versus uh, uh, versus um, uh, versus Morocco case. They know very well what are those, but in the decision itself, or when they litigate the case on behalf of the Polisario Front of on behalf of Morocco, the case itself talks about doctrines of international law, talks about common commercial policy. And of course they introduce the distributive analysis, but they know very well that this is not part or openly the story that the court puts to the fore. And so they use it as policy arguments they, in the last simulation that we had last week, some of them on the Polisario front, they were like, and we have some data assessing the terrible impact of the Sar on the Sahrawi population of this EU-Morocco trade agreement. Of course, they didn't have any data. We haven't seen those impact assessments, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, they were going in the right directions. I'm sure if you open up some memos of the court and you really talk to the lawyers of the Polisario Front, they will have those impact assessments. And, um, and same thing, uh, they do not make it in the official you know, decisions that you see online, the Court of Justice, but if you scrape beyond the surface, you talk to the lawyers, you talk to the parties, you'll see those distributive um, arguments being certainly a big part of the decision and um, very relevant for the outcome of the case, maybe not so much the written decision of the court. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Fernanda, and, and, and thank you again. Yola, so, so many things on the 